But she, of course, was reading outside the curriculum. At this, this, this silly high school I went to in Southern in California, we didn't read anything serious. And she said, "Why don't you read T.S. Eliot or Virginia Woolf?" Now, I wasn't complete. I, I knew that those were not rock bands. I knew they were actual authors, but I just never thought I would read one of them. thought leader behind creating today's program. So please help me thank all of those people for making this program possible. Today we're combining legal scholarship with insights from authors, humanities professors, uh, and performers to provide per fresh perspectives on the works that are entering the public domain today. This kind of multidisciplinary approach to education is a hallmark of what we do at Suffolk uh, and specifically what we do in the area of intellectual property law. The law school's intellectual property programs have been ranked among the best in the country by U.S. News and World Report uh, for four of the last five years, including last year. So we're re really incredibly proud of the work we do here at Suffolk Law in the area of intellectual property and thinking about this work in multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary ways. So we could not be more delighted than to welcome you uh, to Suffolk Law for this program. And I wish you all a very happy public domain day. So thank you all for being here. Good morning. I am uh, Rebecca Curtin. Uh, this conference may have been born as my brainchild, but it has been raised by an intellectual village. Uh, and I want to especially thank uh, Karen Katz, our director of uh, IP programs, for her undaunted vision and indefatigable enthusiasm, uh, without which this idea could never have reached its full potential. With the help of Associate Dean uh, Leah Chan Grinwald, uh, Director of Sports Services Janine LaFauci, Stacey Millis, and the tireless work of many other <laughs> Suffolk community members, we have come together to mark an important milestone, not just in the history of American copyright law, but also in the living evolution of the expressive works that are touched by copyright law. The passage of the Copyright Term Extension Act of 1998 added 20 years to the copyright term of all works still under copyright protection in the United States at that time. In a sense, from the standpoint of term expiration, freezing the American public domain in amber until January 1st, 2019. On that date, the copyright term for works first published in 1923 expired, and a new group of works became fully accessible to the public. Barring any further legislative additions to the copyright term, we can expect the public domain to begin growing again from the expiration of copyright terms year over year as works published in 1924 are freed from the exclusive rights of the copyright holder on January 1st, 2020, and so on until we reach works that were created after January 1st, 1978, the effective date of the 1976 Act which changed the basis of copyright duration <clears throat> from a fixed term after publication to a fixed term after the death of the author. But in the meantime, more than 50 years of published works are now once again set to cascade into the public domain as their copyright terms expire. It isn't difficult to imagine the great legacy of the works that are now entering the public domain, works that we might, for the first time ever, display or perform without requiring a license, or freely adapt, reuse, or remake, even outside the limits of a fair use defense. There are silent films by Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and Laurel and Hardy. There are artistic works by M.C. Escher, Picasso, Kandinsky, and Man Ray. There are cartoons featuring Felix the Cat and short stories by Virginia Woolf and Ernest Hemingway. Soon, the works of the Harlem Renaissance will enter the public domain. There are so many works of the 1920s that have remained touchstones of culture, and perhaps many other works less <laughs> well-remembered that are waiting for a second act to be picked up 
and used in some new way unimagined by their creators. Gertrude Stein once described the process of composition in the following way. There was a groping for using everything, and there was a groping for a continuous present, and there was an inevitable beginning of beginning again and again and again. This month, the growth of the public domain began again. One of the themes of our conference today is to explore what difference this lowering of barriers to access, distribution, and reuse of those works might make, which depends in part on our understanding of copyright expiration as an important milestone. So our events today are designed to raise awareness of the interaction between copyright scope and the public domain. And to do that effectively, we needed to bring together experts both in copyright law and in the works that are passing out of its protection to highlight the creative force of these works as they become more fully accessible layers of the bedrock foundation for future works yet to be created. To that end, it is fitting that we will begin by hearing from Michael Cunningham, an author who has engaged deeply and beautifully with the work of Virginia Woolf. In his Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Hours, Mr. Cunningham explores, reflects, and refracts the art that illuminates Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Mr. Cunningham's work recalls Woolf's exquisite, exquisite craft while at the same time calling up something new, something entirely his own, giving a future to that continuous present and assuring the place of his work in it. In turn, his work has more than once inspired critically acclaimed film adaptations. And recently, he has been said to have reimagined fairy tales anew. Uh, in his most recent novel, The Snow Queen, and a collection of stories entitled A Wild Swan and Other Tales. In addition to the Pulitzer Prize, uh, Mr. Cunningham is a recipient of the Penn Faulkner Award, the Whiting Writers Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship, among other recognitions of his distinguished work. Please join me in welcoming Michael Cunningham to the podium. Great. Uh, well, I will, after the, this brief talk, want to personally thank every single one of you who came out in three degree weather for this. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, there will be people who know far more about the public domain than I do. Um, well, here it is. Here's what I have to say. Um, <clears throat> Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, published in 1925, has been in the public domain for almost 20 years. I'm struck by the fact that I was allowed to pillage it from my own novel, The Hours, free of charge, but that when writing a different book, I paid $500 to Tom Jones, the singer, for the use of two lines from his song, What's New Pussycat? The topic of the public domain naturally speaks to the questions, question which books are still read, are still meaningful to us decades after their initial publication, and which aren't. Most, of course, aren't. Mrs. Dalloway and the rest of Wolf's Oeuvre are. Now, there's not, as far as I'm concerned, much mystery about the ongoing life of the writers we still read today. I do, however, feel honor bound to mention the series of quote unquote lost masterpieces that has been published by the New York Review since 1999. I mean no disrespect to Wolf or any other canonical writer if I say I'm continually surprised by how many remarkable books have been consigned to relatively, or in some cases, complete obscurity. Yeah, but that's another subject for another day. Well, I suspect that many of you here are familiar with Virginia Woolf's work. <clears throat> and all of us who have read, the cla read classics have had an introduction of some kind or another. I was 15 years old in 
Los Angeles, California, not generally known as, as a bastion of classical studies. Um, and I wasn't really much of a reader. I was more of a skateboard kid. Um, and one day I found myself um, having a cigarette, specifically a Kent that I'd stolen from my mother's purse, um, in a little area where we went, where we aspiring criminals went to smoke. And um, I found myself standing next to a girl that I can only describe as the pirate queen of our high school. Pretty much every school has this girl, right? She's tall and beautiful and mean, and, and an older boy picks her up in a Mustang after school, uh, and and she dresses in skin the skins of animals she'd slain. And um, <clears throat> I was there. It was her, and I thought, you know, talk fast, make her love you. Um, and I was twaddling on something about how I thought Leonard Cohen was, was superior to Bob Dylan. Um, and she kind of looked at me. I don't think I sang, but I may have. Um, she kind of looked at me from her great height, sucked in her Marlboro. Her cigarettes were cooler than mine. And I, I like to think that this was not so unkindly meant as it may sound here in this room. Have you ever thought of being less stupid? <laughs> and you know, I had thought about it. <laughs> and decided I, I, was, I was kind of happy with the stupid that I already was. But she, of course, was reading outside the curriculum. At this, this, this silly high school I went to in, Southern, in California, we didn't read anything serious. And she said, why don't you read T.S. Eliot or Virginia Woolf? Now, I wasn't complete. I, I knew that those were not rock bands. I knew they were actual authors, but I just never thought I would read one of them. So I went to the library, the double wide on cinder blocks where they kept the books at my school. Um, they didn't have any, any Eliot. They had one book by Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway. I was the only one who'd ever checked it out. And I took it away and I would say I, read, I tried to read it. Um, I didn't understand it. I couldn't tell what was going on in it. Um, but I could see the density and complexity and grace and beauty of those sentences. I could see the way they swoop and soared and paused for a parenthetical and, and, then, and then racked up six, six <clears throat> semicolons, and then somehow, out of all that chaos, came to a landing, and I thought, whoa, wow, 15, right? Um, she was doing with language something like what Jimi Hendrix does with a guitar. And it made me into a reader, essentially. It was my first understanding of what a book could mean. Um, And it was the beginning of a huge change in my life. And when I came to write The Hours, which was my third novel, it mattered enormously that I was able to use it like anybody could. Um, only, if you're, only if you're into it, we could pause for a moment of audience participation. If anyone would like to share a quick, a, a, a brief story of their first encounter with any classical novel, it doesn't have to be Virginia Woolf. Anybody? Yes, please. I read On the Road in the Ninth Grade. Oh my God. I hope you're all right. <laughs> well, I'm glad to see that they've let you out on your own recognizance. <laughs> on the road, ninth grade. Anybody? Yes, please. I read uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And uh, the book, for the most part, was pretty good. And then, uh, spoiler alert for anyone. 
Mm. Uh, I got the end, and Jim was free the whole time. And that seems like kind of a giant middle finger to the reader. <laughs> hey, there was never any conflict. So. Yeah, yeah. So you never read another classic book again? <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I'm teasing. Maybe one more, anybody have a story about, about it early? In yes, please. My version of the Pirate Queen was my older and much more sophisticated cousin in Bayside, Queens, who thought Ooh. the Inferno. The Inferno. The age of 50. Wow, wow, that was a big leap. <laughs> did, it, did it affect you? It did. Yeah. I'm 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 a, I'm I'm a big advocate of giving kids books they don't really understand. I I I, th I think it gets in somehow. Thank you. Um, let's go back to the early 1920s when Wolf was first thinking about the book that would become Mrs. Dalloway, her fourth novel, and in my opinion, her first really great revolutionary one. Um, Virginia and her husband Leonard had moved to Richmond, which was then a remote suburb of London for. Virginia's health, uh, Virginia's health, physical and mental, were not good. Um, now, most writers suffer crises of confidence. Most writers are also possessed of genuine confidence. You can't really be a writer if you're continually paralyzed by doubt. Now, Wolf knew she had a gift. She also had tremendous courage. She once said, I will not be famous. Great. I will go on adventuring, char changing, opening my mind and my eyes, refusing to be stamped and stereotyped. The thing is to free oneself, to let it find its dimension, not be impeded. Now, courage and confidence are not exactly synonyms, but for a writer's purposes, they might as well be. And yet, Along with her courage and her convictions, it seems safe to say that Wolfe may have been among the least self-assured great writers who've ever lived. As she worked on Mrs. Dalloway, she said, you know, I have wasted all my time trying to begin things and picking up different points of view and dropping them and grinding out the dullest stuff, which makes my blood run thick. Those are her early feelings about Mrs. Dalloway. Now, at about the same time, not far away in Zurich, James Joyce, at work on Ulysses, said, a man of genius makes no mistakes. <laughs> His errors are vocational and are the portals of discovery. Now, as it happens, Wolf and Joyce were both born during the same year and died during the same year. <clears throat> you know, here then we have two tem contemporaneous writers, one of whom believes that her work is a trivial experiment, will be almost instantly forgotten, another of whom believes his work will last forever because even its errors and lapses are proof of the author's genius. And yet both writers went on to become towering literary figures, almost certain to be read as long as there's anyone left alive to read it at all. Which means, I have no idea what it means. But it's always been interesting to me that over here is terrified, insecure Virginia Woolf, and over here is James Joyce saying, Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm even better than I thought I was yesterday. <laughs> and they're both, they're both writing great books. If anyone who knows what that, what, what that means, please come up to me afterwards. Um, now, barring the occasional figure, like Emily Dickinson, and even she tried to publish a few poems, um, it seems that relatively few immortal writers are entirely unknown during their lifetimes. Though we as a species tend to choose the right writers, but the wrong books. Now, Herman Melville's big books were his early travel books, Taipei and Omu. And Moby Dick more or less vanished until it was rediscovered by a Canadian scholar in 1914. 
Oh, I like this one. F. Scott Fitzgerald was primarily known for his first novel, This Side of Paradise. The Great Gatsby was generally snubbed by critics and bought by almost no one. Now, it was rescued during World War II when publishers sent millions of paperback books to GIs overseas, and among them was a little backlist item called The Great Gatsby, which was a huge hit among the soldiers. We do, in fact, have the military to thank for the resuscitation of The Great Gatsby. <laughs> now, Wolf's only bestseller was a late novel, The Years, which is one of her few books not widely read today. Let's just say it was her least, one of her least risky experimental novels. Uh, with the unexpected windfall from the years, she bought a fur coat, which, please forgive the ghoulishness of this, was the coat she wore when she forced a stone into its pocket and drowned herself in the River Ouse. Wolf always fell into depressions after she'd finished a novel. The eagerness she felt while finishing the book inevitably gave way to bitter disappointment over the actual finished book. She said of the waves, oh, despair at the badness of the book. I can't even think how I could write such stuff. The waves. Wrong about that. <clears throat> She ended her life after finishing the novel Between the Acts, which coincided with the beginning of World War II. It seems that the one and the other combined were just more than she could bear. Oh, and by the way, a relatively recently discovered document, a Nazi list of people who, the Eng English citizens who were going to be round up and sent to camps if they conquered England included Leonard and Virginia. Now, after her death, Wolfe's reputation tapered off. It was revived when Leonard published her collected essays, which became touchstones of feminism, most prominently a room of one's own, and her fiction was rediscovered by way of her essays. You know, in short, most great writers may need a little posthumous help at the start of their journey into history, whether it's at the hands of scholars or servicemen and women. In short, it's not easy being a genius. It certainly wasn't for Wolf. And it probably wasn't all that easy even for Joyce. It seems safe to say that great artists often gave us more than they got from us. Um, I assume it goes without saying that the public domain is another step on this process, you know? One, one minute, a private in the army stationed overseas is saying, hey, have you read The Great Gatsby? It's pretty good. And the next minute, The Great Gatsby is ours. It's always been ours, but, but really and truly ours to do with as we choose. It's restored to us as it should be, as I like to think Fitzgerald would have wanted it to be. And now, it's not all, at all surprising that Wolf left us the best possible summation of the life and work of artists not sufficiently appreciated in their lifetimes. This is the closing of the lighthouse. There it was, Lily Briscoe, her picture. Yes, with all its greens and blues, its lines running up and across, its attempt at something. It would be hung in the attic, she thought. It would be destroyed. But what did that matter, she asked herself, taking up <clears throat> her brush again with a sudden intensity, as if she saw it clear for a second. She drew the line there in the center. It was done. It was finished. Yes, she thought, laying down her brush in extreme fatigue. I've had my vision. My thanks to everyone who is doing 
everything you're doing to keep those visions alive and to keep them all the more alive for remaining in the public domain. And it seems only right that Virginia have the last word. Thank you.